first I would like to say that I'm speaking uh, not for myself, but as a follower and helper and representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is the spiritual head of the fastest growing group, religious group, of black people here in the Western Hemisphere. When we give our views, we don't give them as a civic group, we don't give them as a political group, but we give them primarily as a religious group. And any solution that we support, we absolutely uh, feel that it's a religious solution rather than a political solution. One of the one of the reasons that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, in teaching us here in America, uh, is giving us a solution that differs drastically from the sit-in movement. He's trying to make us men. Now, the the very fact that you find students all over the world today are standing up for their rights and fighting for their rights, but here in America, the so-called Negro students have allowed themselves to be maneuvered under a tag uh, of sit-in. It actually, I guess it describes, it. the, the name describes its nature. That it's a passive thing. And uh, if their goal is uh, integration, it's not a worthwhile one, but if their goal is freedom, justice, and equality, then that's a worthwhile goal. If integration is going to give the black people in America complete freedom, complete justice, and complete equality, then it's a worthwhile goal. The holding this integration uh, uh, bottle, and dangling it in front of the Negroes in America today, has actually uh, disabled them, or it has uh, nullified their ability to stand up and fight like a man for something that is theirs by right, rather than to just sit around and beg and wait for the white man to make up his mind that they're worthy to have this type thing. I think that this is, in my opinion, why we disagree with the uh, sit-in movement. If uh, they are willing to wait for another hundred years for the white man to change his mind, to accept them as a human being, then they're wrong. Uh, but if they're willing to lay down their life tonight or in the morning in order that we can have what is ours by right tonight or in the morning, then it's a good movement. But as long as they're willing to wait for the white man to make up his mind that they are qualified to be respected as human beings, then I'm afraid that all of their uh, waiting and their planning is for naught. Uh, as, as Thurgood Marshall said on New Year's Eve, uh, the, the Supreme Court brought about the desegregation decision, I think, uh, six or seven years ago, and there is only 6% desegregation in America right now. We don't call uh, two students, black students, going to the University of Georgia integration, nor do we cause, call... Uh, Four children, black children going to school in New Orleans, integration. Nor do we call a handful of black students going to school in Little Rock, integration. If every black man in the state of Arkansas can't go to any school he wants, that's not integration. And if every black child in the state of Louisiana cannot go to any school that they are qualified for in the morning, then that's not integration. And likewise with Georgia and any other state in America. It's no integration with us until the entire thing is given, is laid on the table, not a hundred years from now, but in the morning. And at the rate that the NAACP, CORE, and uh, uh, the Urban League is uh, willing to accept the, the change of attitude in the white man's mind, we who are Muslims feel we'll be sitting around here in America for another thousand years, uh, not waiting for civil rights or something like that, but even waiting to be uh, granted the rights of a human being. I have the feeling that... Um a great many words have been floating around have been floating around this table which need to be um, redefined. And that, by the way, is the problem I think which faces facing this entire country. Now I don't agree with Mr. X about the student movement, and I do know something about the war, the incipient war between the students and some of the leaders. I know I know the gap, the enormous gap between the NAACP and the children in the South. I don't agree that the sit in you know, I don't agree that it is necessarily passive. I think it demands a tremendous amount of power in one's, in one's personal life and, and, and in terms of political or polemical activity, sometimes to, to, to sit down and do nothing or seem to do nothing. But finally, when the, when the civil movement started, or when a great many things started in, this, in, the, in the Western world, it was not, I don't think, I think it had a great deal less to do with equality than it had to do with power. And I do think we have to talk about we have to decide what we want, you know. Now, 
what has happened in the world in relation to black people is not the white people who suddenly change or become more uh, more conscious of, of a black man's humanity. It is what has happened is very simple. This is the white power has been broken, and and this means among other things that it is no longer possible for an Englishman to describe an African and make the African believe it. It is no longer possible for a white man in this country to tell a Negro who he is and make the Negro believe this. The controlling image is absolutely gone. Now it seems to me the responsibility which faces us then, the question which faces us, which faces me in any case, is since there is a distinction between power and equality, there is a distinction between power and freedom. And I know that in terms, for example, of, of Africa, that an African nation cannot expect to be respected unless it is free. I know that it, unless it is, unless it has its political destiny in its own hands, which is what we mean by power, there is no hope that the English will deal with an African nation on they will deal with an African nation as a, sub, as a subjugated nation as long as it is in fact subjugated. That is not quite the same situation that we face here in America as American Negroes. I can see that I might very well, for one reason or another, leave this country tomorrow and never come back. But this will not make me, this will not cease, I will not cease to be an American Negro for this reason. And the history of our, our history in this country is something that I think we have to face, especially since we're demanding that white people face it. And whether I like it or not, whether, whether you like it or not, this issue about integration is a, is a false issue because we have been integrated here ever since we got here. I am no longer a pure African. There are no pure Africans in this country. The history which has produced us is something which in any case we're going to have to deal with one of these days. Now, I think it is a mistake to pretend this issue did not happen. What we're arguing about, I think, one of the things in any case I think I would be arguing about is the effect of this on the Negro world and the great divisions in it, so that, so that it does in fact range from people who imagine they are white, you know, who never talk to Negroes, to people who imagine that if they can make a buck, they will somehow beat the system, to homeless and, and demoralized black boys and girls who have nowhere to, don't know where to go. The issue, it seems to me, the reason that the city movement is important, the reason this whole ferment is of such importance, is not that I want anybody's cup of coffee or even to go, particularly to anybody's school. It is because the country cannot afford, the country cannot afford to have, as it has at this moment, millions of black boys and girls in various ghettos all over the country, either perishing literally, or perishing, I must say, finally, with bitter, the kind of demoral, demoralization and bitterness and hatred, which can, after all, blow this country wide apart. The importance, in my mind, of the Muslim movement, in conclusion, is that it is the first time, I think, in the history of this country that uh, a Negro audience, a, a, a Negro laborer, a Negro, a Negro schoolboy has heard his own condition described and without anybody trying to flinch from it. It is very different hearing a speech by Roy Wilkins in which, you know, um, one is told in one way or another that tomorrow will be better. Uh, and I think this has a tremendous effect this is the reason the Muslim, I think the Muslim speaker has so much power over his audience. It comes out of a failure in the Republic. This country has lied about the Negro situation for 100 years. And now that what has happened is the lies are no longer viable, can no longer be, can, can no longer be accepted even when they can be told. And the country has waited so long that it does not know how to handle this. And it's created a moral vacuum. There's a moral vacuum in the, in the Negro ghettos in the same way there's a moral vacuum in New Orleans which is filled with desperate people. Now, I don't think that we can afford this. It seems to me, and now I speak for myself, my quarrel with the official Negro leadership, and my quarrel with um, those such Negroes as imagine they are um, integrated or imagine they have somehow escaped the Negro condition, is that they are not willing to do what I think is absolutely essential when it's got to re-examine the basis, the standards of this country which not only afflict black people, they afflict the entire country. No one in this country, as far as I can see, really knows any longer what it means to be, to be an American. He, he does not know what he means by freedom. He does not know what he means by equality. We live in the most abysmal ignorance of not only the condition of 20 million Negroes in our midst, but the, the whole nature of the life being lived in the rest of the world. And I think that the American, the American white man, the Republic, is paying, is beginning to pay for his treatment of the Negro in terms of what he does not know about the rest of the world. You cannot live, it seems to me, in a, you cannot live 30 years, I'd say, with something in your 
closet which you know is there and pretend it is out there that are something terrible happening to you. By and by, what you can, what I cannot say if I know that any one of you, you know, has um, murdered your brother, your mother, and the corpse is in this room and under the table, and I know it, and you know it, and you know I know it, and we cannot talk about it. It takes no time at all before we cannot talk about anything, before absolute silence descends. And that kind of silence is descended on this country. I think that this country has become a, in, almost inconceivably radical. It has really got to do something that's not done before. And this involves the humanity of everybody in it. And the key to this is in the Negro. If one can face that, one can face anything. But that has not been faced. And I think this is the reason for the confusion and the ferment and the great, great danger. Again, let me say this, and I will stop. I'm not religious. Um, and therefore, since I'm not religious, all theologies, uh, for me, are suspect. All theologies have a certain use. But um, I never, for example, believed in the, image, the, the myth of the virgin birth. I never quite understood why it was necessary to propagate such a peculiar notion. Therefore, you know, in, as theologies go, it seems to me the Muslim theology is just as good as any. One cannot quarrel with it there. I can't, anyway. But I personally, I personally reject that theology that I reject all others. And I don't think that we need it. Now, this is a great, this is a gamble. It's, you know, this is a very reckless thing to say. And perhaps, you know, I'm, perhaps it's very mystical. I know the kind of world I would like to see. I would like to think of myself as not needing to be um, um, supported by a myth. I would like to think of myself as being able to face whatever it is I have to face as me, dealing with what I have and what, and what there is, without having my identity dependent on something which finally has to be believed, which cannot be tested. This is why one is converted to a religion, you know. I think that it, there's something very dangerous in it. What I would like to see, and maybe we'll never live to see it, is a world in which these things are not necessary, which I will not need to invent, in effect, a heritage and a history that can deal with the one I have and will not need, in order to, in order to deal with the rest of the world, will not need to feel superior to them, but simply, simply be a part of them. And it seems to me this may happen. Well, I love to see a world in which there are no blacks, there are no whites. Where it does not matter. Because as long as it does matter, as long as it does matter, and it doesn't matter who is wearing the shoe, the confusion will be great and the bloodshed will be great. Well, I, uh, as a black man, and proud of being a black man, I, I can't conceive of myself as having any desire whatsoever to lose my identity. I wouldn't want to live in a world uh, where none of my kind existed. I, and I do think that the Negro, American, American so-called Negro, is the only person on earth who would be willing to lose his identity in a what you might call a, a new product. Uh, this, I heard one fellow say one day that that their eventually intermarriage and intermixing would take place on such a vast scale that it would produce a chocolate-colored race. And, I, and Martin Luther King was in a uh, discussion, televised discussion, with a white uh, newspaper man. I saw it on the television a couple months ago. And this white newspaper man put this to him. Uh, he said, he pointed out, that he's proud of his white race, he's proud of what he is, he's proud of the, his racial characteristics uh, to the extent where he has no desire to lose it by mixing with any other race. And the thing that he said he couldn't understand was why the so-called Negroes don't have the same uh, racial pride that whites have in trying to retain their characteristics. And Martin Luther King never answered him, although he should have answered him. Uh, I think that it is uh, that it's disastrous for the black people in America to reach the point where they, their race pride, racial pride uh, disappears, and they don't want, they don't care whether their blood is mixed up with someone else's. I think that also one of the things that brings this about, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, the very fact that you have to refer to the black man in America as a Negro shows you that right there something is wrong. An African doesn't accept this term Negro, and uh, you find they teach us in the 
educational system of this country that Negro is a Spanish word that's supposed to mean black, uh, yet when you find the uh, black people who live in Spanish-speaking countries of South and Central America, they don't accept the word Negro to identify themselves. Uh, no one allows himself to be classified <coughs> with, under the word Negro but the black man here in America who is a descendant of the slaves. And very seldom is it ever applied to anybody but the black man in here, here in America who is the descendant of the slaves. When you ask a man his identity, he should use a, a word that connects him with a, with a culture. If you ask him his nationality, it should connect him with, with a nation. Like if I ask a man his nationality and he says German, that connects him with Germany. Or if he says, uh, even if he says German-American, it still connects him with uh, having originated. His family, his history uh, has originated in Germany. If he says he's French-American, it connects him uh, with France. But when you ask the black man in America, and he tells you Negro, he doesn't put any other. He doesn't. He doesn't put in any, any other country a front in in, uh, in front. He puts American Negro, or he'll just say Negro. This doesn't identify him. And usually, when you find a man who calls himself a Negro, he can't tell you what language that he spoke before he came to this country. It's of no consequence, no interest. He believes that prior to coming here, he was a savage in the jungle, and therefore he had no language. And this justifies his uh, lack of knowledge concerning that mother tongue today. And the history, as uh, Mr. Baldwin pointed out, of the white man here in America and the black man here in America, points up the fact that the Negro, or the man here who calls himself a Negro, is just an ex-slave. If he is an ex-slave, I'd rather say he's still a slave. But he's wearing his slave master's name, the name that was given to him during slavery. He's speaking the language of the man who made him a slave because he has no knowledge of his own tongue. He only knows the history, his own history, as taught to him by his former slave master who purposely hid from him his, uh, his own history to make him think that he was an inferior being before being brought here. And uh, Mr. Muhammad teaches us that until the black man here in America is uh, connected or reestablished uh, or given, an, given some knowledge of his existence prior to coming here to America, he, his own uh, appraisal of himself will be so low that he'll actually think that the white man is doing him a favor to let him be here in America no matter what his status is. And he, he also, and this is one of the reasons today why he fights so hard, some of them, to sit down next to the white man. They actually think that the white man is the personification of perfection, and whenever they're allowed to go live in his neighborhood or sit in his restaurant or uh, uh, mingle or socialize with him, that they have attained, that they have made progress. But uh, when they go back and study the history of their own people and the accomplishments of their own people, the civilizations and cultures, black civilizations and black cultures that existed in Africa at a time when the whites in Europe were living a cave-like uh, 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 existence, then immediately their appraisal of their self, of themselves uh, begins to uh, go higher. And they don't think that to beg uh, 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 somebody to uh, mingle with them in this country is any kind of progress whatsoever. And I would like to say one more thing, too, on that nonviolent thing, that the black man in America is the only one who is encouraged to be nonviolent, or the black man in Africa, or the black man in Asia. Uh, never do you find white people encouraging other whites to be nonviolent. Uh, whites uh, idolize fighters. They idolize the Hungarian freedom fighters who came to this country and are right now can work on jobs that the sit-in students can't get, can live in neighborhoods that the sit-in students can't live in, and can go into play public places that the student sit-ins can't go because they are fighters. Everyone loves a fighter. They respect the fighter. And, but at the same time that they admire these fighters, they encourage the so-called Negro in America to get his uh, uh, desires fulfilled with a sit-in stroke or a passive approach or a love-your-enemy uh, approach or pray for those who despitefully use you. This is insane. And we feel as Muslims, until we see white people practicing this nonviolence, take Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese uh, attacked Pearl Harbor, the American white man didn't say, pray for the Japanese and uh, let them now bomb Manhattan or uh, Staten Island. No, they said, praise the Lord, but pass the ammunition. But, uh, and if anybody comes along, like Mr. Muhammad, and begins to point out uncompromisingly in blunt terms that don't need interpret diplomatic language that can be misinterpreted, 
And he begins to point out these atrocities and crimes that have been committed against black people here in America today. The white man can never deny the fact that he's guilty, but he'll always say, well, forget the past and let's look forward. But uh, uh, the only people who are told to forget the injustices that have been done to them are the black people. But when it comes to whites, right today, you can turn on any radio, turn on any television, read any newspaper, and the uh, Jews have magnified to the world the crimes that were committed against them 20 years ago or so by Eichmann. Uh, and they keep you sitting on the edge of your seat wanting to strangle Eichmann. It's almost like a hate Germany uh, campaign. But yet the Jews are never accused of teaching hate because they remind, of the world, remind the world of the crimes that were committed against them. But when the black man here in America begins to stand up and speak about the crimes that are committed against him throughout America every day, no let up, just different forms, immediately a black man who dwells on that is considered a racist, considered an extremist, or considered someone who is advocating a doctrine that will bring about violence and bring about a deterioration in the so-called good relations that are supposed to be developing between black and white in this country. So we just can't go along with any of that. And I think that this is the thing that the white people of America should realize, that Mr. Muhammad's teaching, and it's spreading, so you have to deal with it, Mr. Muhammad's teaching doesn't teach the black man to wait for the white man to change his mind. Mr. Muhammad's teaching is changing the, the black man's appraisal of himself. And as soon as the black man uh, undergoes a reappraisal of himself and realizes that he's a man too, he says to himself, why should he wait for the Supreme Court? to give him what a white man has when he's born? Why should he wait for the Congress or the Senate or the President to tell him that he should have this when if he's a man the same as that man is a man, he doesn't need any President, he doesn't need any Congress, he doesn't need any Supreme Court, he doesn't need anybody but himself to bring about that which is his if he is a man. I think we, I think in the first place, there's some um, disagreement between Mr. Mr. Malcolm X and myself as to what this heritage is. And I want to go back to that in a minute. Something else at the moment is bothers me. That I think there's a great deal. There's a lot of. There's not much clarity in this question of violence. From my point of view, from where I sit, whether whether or not, um, no matter what Mr. X wants, no matter what I want, I believe, for example, that one of these days, maybe tomorrow, Birmingham, Alabama, will probably blow up. And if Birmingham blows up, it will not just stretch to Atlanta. It will stretch to Boston. There's a kind of fuse, there's a kind of, um, there's, a, there's an undercurrent, there's something which, which unites all the Negroes in this country, so that what happens in Birmingham can blow up Harlem. It has happened before. And if, unless we are extremely swift and miraculously swift, it will happen again. I take it, I take violence, I'm trying to say this, I take it as, as given. I think it is coming in any case. What exercises in my mind is what happens then. In the first place, this country, in this position in the world now, this extremely precarious position in the world now, the situation of the Negro here is different from that of the Jews in Germany, let us say, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, in that, in that if Birmingham should blow up, if they, sh if they should really erupt in, in America this week, really re of real, of real, uh, real racial violence, it would have repercussions all over the world. I'm afraid we have to say, face this fact that when the Jews are being slaughtered in Germany in the very beginning, no one seemed to care. Millions of Jews crossed the world, and bo boatloads of them, and no country would let them in. But the American Negro has something working for him in this context, or the country has something working against it, which I don't think he can afford. But I want to get back to this question of identity, because it seems to me this is where the, this is where really where um, all the questions are. Uh, Mr. Malcolm X disagrees with the word Negro, and I can see his point. I can say that it doesn't at the moment much, in much interest me, but um, that may be my fault. What I am concerned about, though, is the actual history of Negroes in this country. I think one has got to face the fact that it has been one of the ugliest histories in the history of the West. But as one can face this fact, there is another fact which I think one has got to face, which is also one of the most remarkable histories that we know of. And I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, all the good things that white people did, you know, for the poor darkies and all that um, jazz. I'm talking about the effect of this experience on, on the people who underwent it, the masters and the slaves, what it did to them. I would be a very different person if I were not the descendant of a slave. In fact, I am the descendant of a slave. This is one of the things I have to deal with because it is true. 
And I don't think that, that it has to be a badge of shame. Negroes are not the only slaves. We are not the only descendants of slaves. I can't eliminate one half of my ancestors. My grandmother was raped, let us, let us say. This is a fact I have to face. This means that I'm no longer a pure African and that my relationship to white people is not that of a Congolese to Belgium and cannot be no matter how hard I try to make it that. My relationship to white people is, is dictated by my mother's relationship to them, my father's, by the fact that my grandmother uh, nursed children who grew up to lynch her children, that my father's fathers were always on the heel of some benevolent white man, and the whole myth of this experience has come into being in the country, which is at its highest seen in Falkland and its lowest seen in Margaret Mitchell. Now, I don't think that we can be liberated from this history until we are willing to deal with it. And this means that I have to deal with it as well as any white man in the country has to deal with it. There's really too much and too little to say. What is the issue here? Malcolm X wants us to act like men, and it seems to me, one of the things that I object to here, I don't think that the fact that white people have done what they have done, um, Patrick Henry is not one of my heroes, I'm sorry. Most American heroes have never been in my Hall of Fame. I don't see any reason for me, at this late date, to begin modeling myself on an image which I've always found, frankly, to be <laughs> mediocre and not a standard to which I myself could repair. I don't think that black men now should be, because white men have committed these crimes, that black men should, should do the same thing. I think that there is something absolutely insidious, even, even if I cannot make this absolutely clear, there's something, to my mind, always to be insidious in the whole question of race. The white man's racial characteristics, of which the white man claims to be so proud, have reduced him in this country to some, to, to incredible levels. There is nobody in the world, I think, sadder than a, a white man in the deep south who only has his skin and his blue eyes and his yellow hair and nothing else. I don't think that I want to go through the world, and I will not encourage my nephew to begin to go through the world only armed with his, the color of his skin. The only thing that really arms anybody when the chips are down is how closely, how thoroughly he can relate to himself and deal with the world, yes, as a man, you know, but I don't think, I think, when I talk about standards, I say they're all going to be revised. It's one of the standards that has to be revised. I don't think that a warrior is necessarily a man. And in fact, it has been proven that football players and all these people in teams and in armies are not men. It is very difficult to be a man. And what it involves, for me, anyway, is an ability to look at the world, to look at whatever it is, and to say what it is and to deal with it, to face it, even if it does mean laying down your life, because in a way it always does mean that.